You just feel dirty after watching this. Like you need to take yeah. a shower after you watch Texas Chainsaw. Definitely. So does Sally. Um, She's going to need a after, lot more after, than after a shower. the events of that movie. Therapy. <laughs> Xanax. <laughs> Hello and welcome to My Favorite Movie Is, a podcast all about why we love our favorite movies. My name is Larry Fried and I am the host and creator of this show and happy Halloween to all of our listeners and viewers. We are finally approaching the apex of spooky season and while we covered a truly terrifying film last week, I know all you horror stands are looking for us to cover a true genre piece and our guest for today's episode, Chris Michael, comedian and good friend of mine, has you covered with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The cinematography is like documentary style. The handheld stuff I feel like makes it feel more real. And then the dolly shots, the more abstract shots, make you kind of feel like you're in a nightmare. This is normally the part of the intro where I talk about how great this episode is and how great our guest is, but uh, I actually did that when we recorded it. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, but before we do, just a reminder, we go way past the red tape and deep into spoilers on every episode of My Favorite Movie Is, including this one. So if you want to savor every scare that Toby Hooper has for you in this truly spine-chilling film, uh, you should go watch it first and then come back to us. In the meantime, though, if you're looking for some MFMI content, check out our podcast page, check out our YouTube channel. We've got other episodes for you. They're all great. Oh, and one more thing, just a quick trigger warning for anybody who gets squeamish with bones or blood or gore or screaming. Um, there's a lot of that in this movie and we will be showing clips. So I will let you use your own discretion as to whether or not you should actually listen to this episode. I think you should, but um, it's not gonna be an easy one. But in the meantime, it's time to talk about a true horror classic in the spirit of Halloween. Chris Michael, take it away. Hello, I'm Christopher Michael, and my favorite movie is The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Chris Michael, welcome to My Favorite Movie oh, Is. Oh, How are you, you doing? I am good. Thank you for having me, Larry. Uh, this is a very special episode for a few reasons. Number one, you're here. Yes. Number yes, two, we are in studio. This is the first in-studio episode of the show. Oh. We have another one coming later in the season. So I'm breaking the ice. You're, break, you're breaking the I'm ice. I'm the lab rat. Yes, 100%. But I mean, you're, you're pretty cozy, right? It's a pretty cozy space. Oh, yeah. I'm ready. On the list of great reasons why this episode exists, that's one. <laughs> two is that it's... A Halloween themed episode. Yes. We're getting spoopy. And we're talking about one of the quintessential horror films ever, one of the yeah. seminal slasher films, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You brought in your, is that the 40th anniversary? 40th anniversary special edition, 4K, Blu ray, mm. and DVD combo. Yes. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So we, we're, we got our props. It's hard to do holiday themed versions of this show because we kind of go guest first when we're curating you know who's going to be on the show i reach out to people i say like what are your favorite movies and you know whether or not it's halloween themed or holiday themed is totally based on what they tell me right, right. so you told me texas chainsaw and i was like oh, there's our halloween episode right there so we oh, so we are yeah. set i'm gonna get into more reasons why this episode's gonna be awesome but before we do tell the folks at home who you are what you do, give them a little Holy. primer. Holy, all right. Hello, folks at home. My name is Chris <laughs> Michael. Uh, I'm 24 years old. I feel like I'm <laughs> in college right now. My major is journalism. <laughs> and uh, no, I mean, it is, but. So I, I, my name is Chris and I do comedy and writing and things like that, filmmaking, all the, the good stuff and film watching and video game play. Well, well, you have to be a film watcher to be on this show. So, yes, uh, for sure. so that's a good thing. But you do comedy. It's yes. kind of your main bag. We've had a couple of other guests on the show so far who aren't really filmmakers, not even really film adjacent. We had uh, our mutual friend Katie Siegel on the mm -hmm. show earlier, and she's like more of a stage actress, right, right. A comedian. And my friend Asai was on the show talking about Godzilla a few weeks ago, and he's more of a game reviewer. It's great to have that variety of guests, you know, people who yeah, cover a wide sure. spectrum of art and creation. 
So here we are, just adding more diversity to that list. That's the third reason why this episode <laughs> is awesome. But here's my favorite reason that this episode is great, is because this is the first episode of the show that we're doing where I had not seen the movie previously oh, before okay. we decided to choose it. So the past four, I had seen it before. Granted, some of them I hadn't seen in a while, but like you right, know, this yeah. was like fresh, fresh. fresh. Yeah. Like I, I had never seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I sort of used to avoid horror like the plague when I was first getting into film because I just you know was very easily scared, and I was like, mm. um, and this movie when you its reputation kind of precedes itself. You know, like you you For sure, you yeah. know of the horror behind it and, and you just and you, you've seen so many images of Leatherface with the chainsaw and so the non-horror person in me was like I don't really want to watch this <laughs> um but I'm so glad that I watched it I've yeah. seen it twice now and I'm really glad we're talking about it because this is an amazing yeah. film like exceptional film we're checking off so many boxes on yeah. today's episode it's a good day to be an MFMI fan um Where's my camera? Your camera's over there. <laughs> so give him, Great. give him a wave, give him a wave. <laughs> We're gonna start off this conversation like we do with every episode. Tell me about your first experience watching this film. How did you discover it? What was it like watching it, and what stuck out for you after you watched it for the first time? I can be real, right? Be I can, real. I can curse. We, we only want real. Well, you know, don't go crazy, but you know. <laughs> It's like a, like a dash. It's like you're doing a recipe out of dash or a sprint. All right. So the first time I watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was Halloween of 2019, I believe. Which, is, which makes this perfect. I this was the Halloween episode. Alone. <laughs> I put on Netflix and saw that it was You can there. see he's a comedian. Did we mention he's a comedian? He does comedy. Oh, no. I was just... Uh, I'm just lonely. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, it was on Netflix. They had it in 4K on Netflix as well. Amazing. And I was like, I heard so much about this film. Time for me to watch it. So packed a big, fat bowl of marijuana, ripped it, <laughs> and proceeded to put the movie on. And holy. See, <laughs> this movie, Sober, is already haunting and terrifying. Oh, yeah. it, when you're high, I can only imagine it's, it is god awful. Yeah, it was intense. Like, yeah. You know. Like you couldn't move probably at certain, oh, no, at certain yeah, points, no. yeah. And you can't look away either. It's kind of definitely not kind of yeah. film where you're just kind of locked in and you just yeah, you know. So if you're stoned, like fuck. <laughs> you know? But I was like you too with like kind of being weary about horror. Mm -hmm. I didn't start getting into horror until I was like in high school. I picked certain movies that I knew weren't super scary to kind of build up to God, Texas got Chainsaw. It. What were what were some of the primer films? The first time I sat down and watched a horror movie like alone was probably Scream. Scream is Scream is a great primer film. Yeah, it's, it's like, like it's half, not that scary. It's half horror, half satire. Right. So you're kind of getting you're getting something light. Yeah. Because then you also through Scream learn like the different tropes and right, what to kind right. of expect. It is with kind horror. of a textbook, a horror yeah, textbook. Yeah, for sure. When you watched this for the first time, what immediately stuck out to you? What were the things that that hit you? about the film so much something about it you know made me want to keep watching it over and over again the more research i did and watching other people's like analysis of it i started to appreciate it for the message that it is pushing which i believe is an anti-capitalist message mm -hmm. um the whole movie i think could be like an allegory for capitalism so the sawyers are the downtrodden folks of society right so they've been pushed over the edge and have decided to stop uh, trying to live within the system and trying to, you know, break their back and do jobs. And they're like, you know what? We're just going to eat people instead. <laughs> steal their bones. Steal their steal bones, corpses. Steal their cars. Yep. And use their gas so they can live off the grid so nobody ever catches them. Their friend group is society, like a microcosm of society. Sure. Franklin is like on the fringe. So he's like the lower class. He's like a burden to everybody else in the group. Every time That's he has to do everything, definitely. they have to help him push his wheelchair. They have to, you know, he f like falls down the pathway in the beginning and they have to like clean him up. And then every time they want to do something like fun, he's like there and kind of like ruining it. Like every time they want to go swimming, whatever. He's on the edge. And then when the hitchhiker attacks him, like you notice he starts like taking on their characteristics. And then right. the camera also starts behaving the same way with him as it does with those two after leatherface kills kirk no after he kills jerry 
and then he goes to the window and it like zooms in on mm-hmm. his face, like mm-hmm. the slow zoom. They do that with Franklin when he's like inspecting the blood on the van. It does like a slow zoom. He's like, okay. he's licking his lips in the exact same way as Leatherface too. <laughs> I think that the movie is saying like, if you're on the fringe of society, uh, one more bad day can like push you to become like the Sawyer family. Right. And the exposure, the exposure to further people of that right of, uh, on that fringe violence well. begets violence essentially when i first saw the film i didn't really register those things and then we had a discussion about it before this episode and you brought up all of these ideas and upon watching it for a second time it feels so much more obvious to yeah. you especially the the veganism Vegan stuff element yeah, of it which we talked about a little bit i think when you first watch it the stuff with the cows, the implementation of the slaughterhouse and those elements, they feel sort of like tangential. You're kind of like, and then of course you get that incredibly haunting montage with the cows in the in the slaughterhouse. And it's very displacing. You're like, what what's going on here? Like oh, I'm not exactly cow, sure. Would they show the like the close up of the cow yeah, like drooling and stuff? Yeah, yeah. It's it's very much like Bleh, like what's happening. Like it feels yeah. like suddenly you're in a different movie. Start squealing and freaking out and everything, and then have to come up and bash you two or three times. But then, when you watch it a second time, you see all of the different ways in which the the people are treated like cows right. in the slaughterhouse. And then, of course, they have the barbecue, the 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 which is um, human meat, right? Or it's implied that it's human meat, right? Exactly. It's like it is an incredible, almost piece of foreshadowing. For the rest of the story, because we see how they're being treated, and now we see that how, what happens when human beings are treated that way. And I can absolutely see somebody who like decides to become vegan or something like after this movie because it's incredibly effective. No, all of the vegan stuff also directly ties into capitalism. So part of the reason that they become killers is because they're forced out of their jobs at the slaughterhouse because of automation. Right, and that's the comment about the air gun. The air gun's no good. <laughs> puts too many people out of jobs is what he says hey man did you go in that slaughter room or whatever they call it the place where they shoot the cattle in the head with that big air gun thing. oh that, that that gun's no good i was in there once with my uncle no way with a sledge <laughs> see that was better they died better that way well, how come I, I thought the gun was better oh no no with the new way to people put out of jobs not only you know do they need money from their jobs to eat and all that shit but they're also get out their murderous inclinations with the cows so they kill the cows to get out their murder and now that they lost their jobs you know <laughs> now, yeah we're what's left for the <laughs> cow. i think another part of this sort of capitalist theme we're talking about is like the ever presence of death yeah and like and murder suffering, and basically. suffering and destruction. Every time you hear a radio thing, there's someone. Someone died from this. Someone died from someone's that. Someone got murdered. Got robbed. Yeah. Here. Someone's someone's balls got cut off. Health officials in San Francisco reluctantly admit they may have a cholera epidemic on their hands. A 16-story building under construction in downtown Atlanta collapsed today, killing at least 29 persons. Opening crypts and mausoleums where there was evidence of tampering. Sheriff's deputies have found a reported dozen coffins robbed of all or part of their contents. Everybody in this film are products of a society that is just rampant with despair and death. And it's all a product of like capitalism, the selfishness of, of people and yeah. what they want. I think it's important also to know the context of the movie was made definitely, in and definitely. released very similar to now, basically. Polit- political <laughs> how, unrest. How, how sad is that? Huh? Yeah, it's it's not good. Yeah. But you know, at least the movie is still relevant, right? That's true. <laughs> but a lot of movies are still relevant. The economy was like dog shit. Nobody had jobs. There was a gas gas shortage, which is why they can't get gas in the movie. And ah, interesting. People, you know, were just seeing footage of like Vietnam and like all this terrible shit on the news all the time. So everybody is just surrounded by death and like apocalyptic news all the time. By framing it that way, he's like showing that kind of like what I said before that anybody could get to this point 
with just a little push. Like if the Texas sun is hot enough one day, <laughs> you will become Leatherface, basically, is like what the movie is saying. What's incredible about all these themes is that they are fairly subtle. They're yeah. really the movie yes, for the sure. movie is not about capitalism. It's not about veganism. It's about a bunch of kids who intrude upon property and yeah. they all they almost all of them get killed. They are these incredibly subtle choices throughout the story that that when you look back on it and you understand, and this is why we we talked about in a previous episode of the show how you watch the film first as a, as a consumer, second as an art as an artist, and third as a philosopher. The film is able to like deliver these messages without you knowing it. I feel like it just fully utilizes being a film, and you know is able to deliver its message artfully, and that's why that's why I love it. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this week's episode of My Favorite Movie Is. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I just wanted to remind you all that you can find more episodes of My Favorite Movie Is by going to our show page on your podcasting platform of choice. And if you like video podcasts, we actually post our video versions for every podcast episode on YouTube. New audio episodes drop every other Monday, and then video episodes drop that following Friday. So I hope you'll subscribe and follow us and hit that notification bell and do all the things you got to do to stay updated on when new episodes go live. Another way to stay updated on when new episodes go live and get some fun bonus content and sneak peeks in between episodes is to follow us on our social media pages at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I hope you guys will find us there and stay updated and check out all the cool stuff we're doing on those platforms. And finally, for a full catalog of audio and video episodes, as well as more information about the show and how you can contact us for any reason, you can go to mfmipodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening to My Favorite Movie Is. Let's get back to the show. I want to talk about the incredible, just technical efforts and, yeah. and ability. I was a little skeptical, first of all, because, you know, Ew, horror, but also the slasher genre as a whole does not have a great reputation. I think a lot of people sort of look at that genre as incredibly silly. Many entries in it are a little dated. I was struck by how well made it is. First of all, I want to talk about the general atmosphere of everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. just the entire thing. The scene where Kirk first meets Leatherface oh, yeah. is one of my favorite scenes in I think anything ever. Yeah. Because it is. No build up. Yeah, there's no, no build up. No there's no there's no jump scares. As soon as Leatherface shows up, bang, hammer yeah. right to the head, and it's basically done. And that's it. And to me, that is ten times more effective than something like and there's like atmosphere, and then suddenly it's like, huh, and then the camera turns and it's like nothing. And they turn around, it's like, huh, you know, like all of those. No, and movies. then it turns around, they're like, hey, Billy. <gasps> yeah, exactly. Like cheap jump scares that mean nothing and that yeah. ultimately that are just pulling people's legs. The movie, like, doesn't have time. First of all, it's very tight. It's, a short, it's like, it's like, a, it's like an movie. 83 minutes or something, 82 minutes. Masterful yeah. choice to do that because there is not that nothing much to the wasted. story. Yeah, this story is not a two and a half hour long movie. This is an yeah. 82 minute short horror story. 83. 83. There's no time to mess around. The movie does not. Pull punches. The movie does not no. attempt to build something that is not there. And granted, this movie does have music and sound design. It supplements the whole. Yeah. First of all, it's completely silent. Then yeah. he gets hit. And then he gets hit again. And then he brings him in and then slams the door. And then and after then the sound comes that's in. That's like, goom. Yeah. And that's the only sound. I guess I'm mostly thinking about the ending. The last, the last scene with the Sawyers, basically, where there's all the music, the like scene. it's almost yeah. like a sensory yeah. overload yeah. of stuff. It adds atmosphere and tension, but it also is it's immediate the telegraphic nature of it is immediately undercut by the movie just being itself, by the movie's yeah. events taking place. And I just found that so like reassuring and incredible. And it was and it was something that won me over while I was watching this movie immediately. That scene with Kirk and Pam. And then, of course, the incredible chase sequence with yeah. Sally 
after um, after Franklin is is killed, how many chase sequences in horror just like go nowhere and feel like like it's like why would you go there? Why would you go there? Why would you do this? Like there are so yeah. many questionable that it's clearly there because like no, we have to make this scene go longer so that way people right, get scared right. longer. There are a number of choices that they that they make that totally subvert this idea. Number one, so much of the sh- of the filmmaking is handheld. And incredibly displacing. It's like handheld shots, yeah. half handheld and then half dolly. Yeah, it's a lot. It's an incredible mix that puts you deeply in the in the place of somebody who's frantically running around. The coloring, the almost exclusively like blue, blue nighttime yeah. coloring, is far more expressionistic, and we can see everything that's happening always. Yeah. There's never a moment where it feels too dark or anything like that. I love when Sally just jumps out the window. Yeah. Sally's just like Leatherface is here. Peace jumps right out yeah. and it's it's again it's another moment in this film where it's like no games we're not playing games we're not overwriting it we're not trying to stretch this thing for what it's not worth we are just no. fully committing to it and we're just constantly moving Another thing I want to talk about in terms of the genre stuff is the bones, the production design. Yeah, a lot of those are real. A lot, yeah, apparently, and most to be honest, real. it feels that way. It does, right? Yeah, they look like because they don't look perfect. They don't. They look like misshapen. Some of them, and they look different. None of them uh, look the same. Prop bones, like plastic, were more expensive than like actual skeletons from India. So they bought like real corpses. Yeah, no, that scene with uh, what is it, Pam? Looking at all the bill, like when she yeah, trips when she, into when that she room. drops into the chicken room or whatever. The first time I watched that, my eyes were so wide. I was like, I know, me it, too. You feel like you're a in that house, and then you feel like, holy shit, I'm yeah. not supposed to be here. It's absolutely, but it's, it's first of all, it's so rare that you see real bones, yeah. honestly, in a horror movie. Not and not just it's human bones and animal bones. There's a yeah. whole mix, but also the chairs being made out of the bones, yeah. the couch or like the the multi-seated thing. The arms the chair. Yeah. With the arms. The lampshade with the face. Yes. Oh my God. That's the thing that hangs up the yeah. right? Crazy, crazy stuff. It feels like someone put a lot of effort into it, but it doesn't feel clean or professional. Yeah. It feels incredibly yeah. like each one was made with care its own individual way to me my my overall grand point is that i think that the the artistry of this film is lost for people who maybe don't give it a chance and who maybe associate it with the genre that it helped to pilot that's why i love this show and i love bringing on movies like this on the show because sometimes these large cultural phenomena that people know but they actually haven't seen all mm-hmm. of the minutia gets lost and it's important to actually see these films yeah, no, I ingest agree. all of the things about them and recognize the artistry of it. And I mean, that's just in terms of genre stuff. I haven't even gotten to something else I want to talk about, which is, as you said, the cinematography, which is so great. So a lot of people say that the cinematography is like documentary style. And the first time I watched the movie, I like didn't really like understand why they said that. But um, I've had to watch like older documentaries like from the 70s and shit for class and now i'm like okay i understand why people are saying that the handheld stuff i feel like makes it feel more real and more um like possible to happen again and then the dolly shots the more abstract shots make you kind of feel like you're in a nightmare with her i'm trying to think there's like a lot of famous shots the shot of uh pam walking to the house after kirk gets killed and it's like under her. There are a couple of those under shots. Yeah, there's a, I, there those are, a lot of those. Those are like some of my favorite shots in the whole film. There is a documentary style that you mentioned, and it's pretty present, especially in the beginning when they're in the van and stuff. There's a lot of kind of like shots where like there's zoom ins and there's handheld movements, and you're like, this does feel like I'm with a bunch of people on a road right, trip. You're just being like documented. sitting in the van with them. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, there's like when they first pick up the hitchhiker, there's that wide shot where the van is like moving and the hitchhiker is like, there's no basically no sound. And the yeah. hitchhiker's like, ah, oh, look at this. There are all these shots in it where you're like, wait, this is like really cinematic. And clearly they had like the tools to do this. And those, those ground shots, are those dolly shots? Yeah, yeah they, so they had like six feet or so of dolly track. And they had to yeah. like, for some of the longer ones, they would have people like taking tracks from the back and putting it in the front. Of, of course, classic. That shot lasts a lot longer than six feet of dolly track. Oh, yeah. So they clearly were like, 
like like moving that's it like, frantically. Is it Tom and Jerry or something where they're like on the railroad and they're placing <laughs> it at the same time? That's like what it is. But um, that's amazing. Great reference. The one with Kirk, Kirk and Pam together. I kind of like more. It's like the, when they're walking. Yeah, it's the first kind of shot that's like that. Yeah. There's like them together, then there's just Pam, then there's Jerry. Jerry, Jerry has yeah. a shot too. But the one with Pam and Kirk comes first. I just remember so viscerally while I was watching it, I saw that shot and I was like, whoa. Like this is yeah. like, they plan this shot. There's clearly some sort of like dolly or, or yeah. rig that they're on. And it looks amazing. And then there's another really good dolly shot that I like during the dinner scene where it's like, it goes back and forth between the rooms. So it's like it zooms into the kitchen and then Leatherface or someone goes like upstairs and then it like zooms back out and you mm-hmm. pass Sally like tied up and then it points at the mm-hmm. stairs and then they come back down. I don't know. I just, uh, yeah, I love those shots. We talked about this a little bit on the Pride and Prejudice episode, how you can have a director who uses different stylistic techniques that can still feel like they work together, even if they were necessarily opposed and it's similar here with texas chainsaw there are these Abstract handheld shots, weird the crazy dinner. shots yeah. and then there are these really cinematic dolly shots but they both work really well yeah. because they they feel intentional and yeah. it feels like when they have the dolly more cinematic shots they evoke the feelings yeah. of the tension and, and the of and the and character there's one shot in the dinner scene that always really strikes me for some reason when she's pleading with them and it cuts to the like medium close up of the hitchhiker and the cook and the hitchhiker's like laughing and uh the cook is like uh you know it's just something you got to do don't mean you have to like it yeah. and it's like that shot of the two of them and he's like smiling something about it is so eerie it's just some things you got to do don't mean you have to like it oh, please. 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 <laughs> yeah the background is like completely blurred and they kind of have like a weird outline like an aura around each of them and it just like is so like <laughs> <laughs> that's what it makes that's me feel. that's just about the general feeling throughout this entire film yeah. just just chills you just feel dirty after watching this like you need to take yeah. a shower after you watch texas chainsaw definitely so does sally um, She's gonna after, get a lot after, more after, than after a shower. The events of that movie, therapy, <laughs> Xanax. <laughs> Chris, this has been a great conversation. Yes, about TCM, TCSM, I guess, because Chainsaw is two T T C C S M. Yeah, it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work as well. We are going to do something that has a much better abbreviation, which is the MFMI Lightning Round, which is a series of superlative questions Subjective. about the f- okay, whatever. It's a series of <laughs> it's a series of questions about the film. Do your best to answer them as rapidly and as uh, impulsively as possible. Uh, just a bunch of favorites about the film. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Favorite scene when Sally runs into the gas station during the chase scene and that whole moment in the in the main gas like specifically the moment when. He leaves to go get the truck, and then he just leaves the door open, mm. and you're just sitting there like, "Where the fuck is everybody?" Is there Would that also of- be your favorite shot? Then is that so? Wait, are we moving on to favorite shot now? Okay, okay favorite shot. All right, favorite shot. Favorite shot is a shot in the dinner scene when it's Sally's POV and the hitchhiker and Leatherface are like, like coming towards her and like teasing her and shit. Favorite line of dialogue. We just picked up Dracula. <laughs> There's another great there's another great line Whole where he says like Dracula's. we just went to the we just went to the home of Bella Lugosi or something. Well, I think we just picked up Dracula. Did you see the birthplace of Bella Lugosi? There is no songs in it and there's minimal amounts of score, but is there a moment, a musical moment in the film that is your favorite? I think honestly it's like the lack of music mm-hmm. is what makes it like stand out. Because so many of the moments are just presented as they happen with no like extra fanfare is there a moment of sound design in particular in the film that you the be, the best moment of sound design what, what would you call it so i'm gonna give two i okay. think one is that droning sound after leatherface slams the door mm-hmm. and it goes dong, dong. yeah that and then all of the like pig sound effects and all yes. the squealing yes right before kirk comes Wait, in right he hears Wait. yeah Wait, he hears Wait. pigs yeah. in the in the slaughterhouse Hey, Pam. Favorite character and, if different, favorite performance? Favorite character is um, Drayton, which is the the cook 
like in the, the old the father the he's, Sawyer father. He's technically their brother, according to the script and according to Toby Hooper, but he de- definitely registers as the father. Look what oh, your... Oh, that's another great line. Look what your brother did to the door. Look what your brother did to the door! Favorite character? I would say he's my favorite character, and then favorite performance is probably the hitchhiker. The hitchhiker's performance is incredible. That scene in the van when they first meet him, when you're so first watching it, it is... <laughs> See, they make hitchies. They take the head and they boil it, except for the tongue. And they scrape all the flesh away from the bone. They, they, they use everything. They don't throw nothing away. You don't know what the fuck he's going to do. Yeah, next. you have it's no so idea. Unpredictable. And the actions are so... I'm still thinking about what his actions mean in that scene. Like, there's, they are... They're so evocative of something so ineffable. You've shared so much trivia already, but if you have a favorite piece of trivia or behind the scenes knowledge, t- share, okay, I've got you've tons. shared a fair amount. There's a lot of weed trivia. <laughs> oh this movie God. is a freaking stoner movie. Um, <laughs> so some weed trivia. It was during the dinner scene shoot. That is like a very infamous 27 to 30 hour or more long shoot that everybody like hates. And the only food that they had on set were pot brownies provided by one of the crew. (laughs) Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen, played by Gunnar Hansen. uh, That's all he had to eat during the chase scenes where they used a live chainsaw, a real chainsaw. So not only is he wearing like six inch boots to be taller, uh, he's stoned as fuck, and he's <laughs> running in the dark with a fucking mask covering his face with a real chainsaw. Oh, how did nobody die? He said that while they were filming that, there was one uh, take where he tripped and threw the chainsaw up into the air, and then he like landed, and it still hadn't landed, and then it fell like right next to him, still on. How did nobody? <laughs> Die. What has been your favorite response from somebody when you tell them that like this is one of your favorite movies? Have you ever gotten a memorable response? I try to show this movie to people because it's like one of my favorites, and I want to. I want them to understand all the <laughs> capitalist uh, commentary. I tried showing it to my mom. She's not really big on horror, and uh, as most moms <laughs> are, you know that the last like. 20 minutes of the movie is just like screaming pretty much. Non-stop like screaming. Like blood-curdling screaming. Yeah. So we watched it and then I was like <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, why did you show me this? Like, why did you force me to watch this? It's like but it, it's art, mom. It's anti-capitalist. That could have been it. That's a good experience. That answers the experience question. Just mighty fine too. Hey, there you go. Two for yeah. one. There you go. Two for one. Do you find yourself quoting any lines from this film in your daily life? Uh, if I have any more fun today, I don't think I'm going to be able to take it. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's a great line to quote casually. If I have any more fun today, I don't think I'm going to be able to take it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new question that I'm adding to the lightning round, and it's an oddly very applicable question in a, in a very ironic, oh, in a very ironic way. Yeah, I know what but if there was one character in this film that you'd want to have dinner with... <sighs> Who would it be and why? Oh my god. I'll have dinner with grandpa. With gra- <laughs> I'm tempted to say Leatherface because at least he'll cook for me. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to pair this film with another film for a double header, uh, what would it be and why? This is gonna tie into your next question as well. The next question and the last question that I have yet to ask you is in the battle of your favorite film, what loses to Texas Chainsaw Massacre? So is the is the is the answer the same? So okay, so the movie I would pick for double feature is Evil Dead Two. I would say watch Texas Chainsaw first and then cool off <laughs> with Evil Dead. Well, yeah, 2. it's interesting you bring that up because Evil Dead Two is much more uh, comedic. Yeah, yeah, no, for and sure. so. I'm curious why is it is it just a sort of a palate cleanser? Yeah, but I also could see how that could be a little intense for one night. I feel like you maybe would do Evil Dead one if you wanted to go for the more horror, like straight. Oh no, straight well, that's horror. why I wanted to do Evil Dead too because I would want it to be like you're terrified and it's horrible and you feel gross, and now you get to laugh. Then you shower it off with laughter, and then you get to shower it off with Bruce Campbell getting his ass kicked by his own foot well evil dead 2 is that also your second favorite movie i would honestly say that it's tied 
But technically, we talked about Texas Chainsaw, so we're well, gonna say Evil Dead. I have your more second. to say about Texas Chainsaw than about Evil Dead Two. I mean, I still have stuff to say, but the stuff to say about Evil Dead Two is just it's funny and cinematography is very inventive, and Sam Raimi is great, and it achieves what its goal is, which is to be an entertaining, campy movie. And Texas Chainsaw achieves its goal of trying to bring a political message or whatever and also be scary. And that's the end of the lightning round. We're done. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, you for, for bringing me. your love of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and your knowledge of and course. for helping us cover our first tried and true horror film on the podcast. Tell the people where they can find you and your work or how they can support you. Oh, plugs. Yeah, plugs. It's been real. I'm Chris. <laughs> and you can follow me on Instagram at Chris Mike. So Chris, M-I-C, six, nine. That's at Instagram. Nice. Uh, I think I have a TikTok as well. <laughs> Chris Mike comedy. You clearly have not had a lot of experience doing this. Social media. <laughs> no, my social media is terrible. Every single account is a different fucking name. Amazing. Well, that's just because people take your names all the time. <laughs> no, but I, I didn't even try for them to be similar. <laughs> YouTube. Okay, I made my YouTube when I was quite literally 11 years old. So the YouTube <laughs> is Turkey Nuggets 567. <laughs> I mean, don't even ask me. I don't understand. But that's what it is. Twitch. Twin witches. Oh. I mean, that has nothing to do with Chris at all. And uh, <laughs> Twitter is Chris underscore <laughs> M-I-C <laughs> underscore arts. So go find me, please. And I don't know. I'll try and change my usernames or something. <laughs> anything left? Anything else to say? to? Or do you have any shows? Are you doing any uh, like like live stuff? Uh, currently, I don't have any live shows, but I am working on uh, editing some short films and like pre-tape sketches. Oh, so. okay. So that's what you have to look forward to there. Anything else you want to say to our viewers before uh, before we sign off? Uh, watch more horror and smoke more weed. There you go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The views, the views of Chris Michael do not reflect the views of my favorite movie is. If you're 21 or younger. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's that's the <laughs> ending. Yeah, I guess we're done. Another huge thank you to Chris Michael for being on the show. What a funny guy, right? And that was all, like, off the cuff. You should see what he's like when he actually gets to, like, write stuff down. Uh, check out his YouTube. Check out his socials. Uh, he's an incredibly talented guy and deserves your support. And uh, not to toot my own horn or anything, but you should be supporting us as well. Uh, if you're new and you enjoyed this episode, please follow us on your podcasting app of choice. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. New audio episodes go up every other Monday and new video episodes go up every other Friday. And you can get updated on when those go live by doing the things I just said you should do, as well as doing the things I'm about to tell you to do, which is follow us on our social media at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We post a lot of fun little sneak peeks and clips there, so uh, you can't lose. And this is just another not-so-casual reminder. If you are an Apple Podcast listener, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps the show tremendously and it only takes like two or three minutes of your time if you're enjoying the show and you like what you're hearing or watching if you're watching this on youtube um please give us some love on that platform and help us grow and make this show something that more people uh will listen to lastly for a full catalog of audio and video episodes as well as more information about the show you can find us at mfmi podcast Dot com. You can also reach out to us at hello at mfmipodcast.com if you have any questions or if you just want to say hi. We'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, and uh, that's about it for this week's episode. Once again, happy Halloween, everybody. I hope you guys have a great holiday. And now, on to Thanksgiving. That's my favorite uh, of the winter holidays. Um, until next time, guys. Thanks for listening. My Favorite Movie Is is a Larry Freed Presents production. It is executive produced, created, hosted, and directed by me, 
Larry Friedman is also produced by me alongside Brian Novak. Our assistant director is Stephen Reyes, and our editors are Clayton and Kimberly Allen. Our graphic designer is Monica Sarmiento. Our motion graphics designer is Elton Greenfield. And our theme song, Now and Then, as well as all original music on our show, is performed and composed by Matt Gorduke. For this episode, our camera operators were Luis Delos Reyes, assistant director Stephen Reyes, and producer Brian Novak. And our sound recordist was Daniel Grunberg. Thank you all so much for helping to make this show what it is. Everybody's websites and portfolios and socials and anything relevant to them are all in the show notes below. My name is Larry Freed, and this has been My Favorite Movie Is. 